Um, this is Janet Fitch, uh, and uh, I was delayed for my Writing Wednesday broadcast, which is usually at uh, noon on Wednesday, so 3 um, Eastern. Um, it's 5 o'clock Pacific, um, 8 Eastern, because uh, I had some family obligations that uh, took longer than I thought, as they always do. Uh, so, uh, tis the season. And you try to get things cleaned up that um, <laughs> that have been hanging over your head for a long time. So this was my day to do it. Um, so welcome to Writing Wednesday, uh, where I answer your writing questions uh, every week. Um, if you want to uh, put your questions in the comments, I am happy to answer them. And uh, I'm also... Uh, happy to take your questions through my website janetfitchwrites.com and I can design a Writing Wednesday around your question. So here we are and it's uh, the week before Christmas, a uh, couple days before Christmas, so wrapping away and thinking a lot about uh, memory, thinking a lot about uh, sensuality, the way certain smells, tastes, sounds, activities unlock memory and the kind of memory they unlock. I think that um, the persistence of otherwise kind of horrible movies, uh, it just is because these movies are, you know, become part of your memory set. So you want to see them because you can remember all the times that you've seen them before. Um, you know, often linking into childhood memories. Hi, Lewis. Hey, I'm sorry to be late. <laughs> so good, good for you to join us. Um, I, you know, it is such a season of sensuality. And uh, if you have not been moved to work on your stories, novels, etc. Uh, right now, it's a good time to do little exercises or take notes, observations of little corners of experience uh, during the holiday season that trigger memory um, and see if you can get a corner of that handkerchief and start pulling it out. Are there certain foods? Oh my God, you know, I haven't had this in a while and it just reminds me of XYZ or how we used to do XYZ. Um, I'm somebody who kind of usually ignores the holidays until they're right on top of me, but luckily I have uh, a daughter who loves the holidays and uh, she, you know, she'll start bringing out the ornaments and what have you and reminding me this is, oh. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of us are devising new, new sense memories for our families and stuff. If you have younger families, you know, these are things that your children will remember because they'll be linked in. Hey, Susie, speaking of holiday memories, um, they'll be linked in by the senses. So if you make a certain dish, if you make a certain mulled wine, the smell in the house will trigger uh, memories, future memories. Um, so we can, you know, you can think about that, uh, but also be be alert for things that hook into the memory, uh, the sense memory, and you know, go go hold hog. You know, I I don't think it's necessarily the time of year to innovate. You know, if there is a special dish that uh, your aunt Ellen used to make, you know, go ahead and make it. Drag out their you know, punch bowl or whatever, um, and start thinking about memory and how memory, scent, and taste are probably the biggest uh, triggers of memory. Um, and, uh, you know, by replicating that, we really can move back in time. Um, the uh, uh, question that I got for this week um, is... Uh, from uh, Ch Chella. So I don't know if Chella, if you are... Uh... Oh, Chelsea is saying, funny enough, I was trying to listen to Christmas music recently and tried a Celine, Celine Dion album from the 90s. I only made it one minute because it reminded me of my grandmother and I 
got way too emotional, major trigger. So I'd say go back and actually play it and take notes on the memories, the way the memory circulates in the body, where, where does it, where memory, uh, emotion in the body, uh, if you do the, um, the uh, Rosetta Stone, where you have a sense phenomena that elicits a big emotional reaction, then write the, what, what it is and follow the emotion through the body. When you pay attention to the emotion, it will, um, it'll start to move and you can see where it enters and then how it moves through the body. And it's amazing to watch it. And if you can take notes on that, if you can keep those kind of reactions in your Rosetta Stone, you can um, give that to a character later on. They hear something and then you can say what, how they, the emotion moves in the body, what happens to them. Um, you know, different emotions hit, hit you in different places and then they move and how they move is, is uh, something you'll be able to use all the time. So expose yourself to that, to those memories. Um, and this is the perfect time of year to do so. Um, I, uh, um, so I have a, uh, question from Chella Corrington and Chella, I don't know if you're on today because we're off time, but maybe you'll check it out. I'm doing your, um, question. So this is a question about, would you please address backstory and central narrative? Um, like mostly this is a question about the use of backstory. You know, when do you use it? How do you use it? Uh, because central narrative doesn't seem to be a problem for people. They, they know where their central narrative is. Um, I, um, I'll talk about backstory and tangents. Because tangents are as interesting as backstory. Something is associative. It makes you think of something. And that could be backstory or it could be all kinds of things. Uh, for instance, um, if you ever listen to Ezra Pound read his own poetry, the, can the cantos in particular, um, Ezra Pound, I knew just, you know, that he was an anti-Semitic nut, but also, you know, he was tremendously influential poet who helped many, many poets, um, you know, put their heads above, above water. He, he helped so many people, which is why, uh, they didn't shoot him, why they put him in a, in a, um, mental institution and a steady stream of writers and artists went to visit him because he had done so much good as well as being, you know, no good to himself, uh, as this is a problem with mental illness, you know, you don't have a sense of perspective or how things are going to be read by other people. But interesting thing about um, Pound, I, I try to re I would try to read Pound it, 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 all the time. Could never make headway with Pound. Uh, the cantos just could not figure out what the hell was going on. And then I heard him read aloud. I heard it on tape. And I realized there's a central narrative and you can hear it in his voice, blah, 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 blah. And then there are these almost Tourette-like outshoots, like little, you know, shoots out this way, shoots out that way, like, like arrows or like mortar fire or something. These side uh, uh, issues or side comments that are in a very loud and kind of manic voice. So he, it's like the rational mind has this straight on narrative and then this manic thing uh, that occurs with his poetry shoots out, shoots out. And if you see it that way, you can see the poem and then you understand where the um, asides are. And so it's like a, um, it's like the central narrative with these side conversations, uh, and they are internal in his case, 
Um, so that's a really interesting way of handling a narrative. Uh, here's a question, and Eva says, reviewing notes from our dialogue weekend. Yeah, I just taught the um, dialogue for fiction writing. Um, and grateful for my insight. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so backstory should be, first of all, you have to say, why am I telling this backstory? How important is it to break the narrative in the middle to tell you something that happened, you know, something your character remembers, something associational? Um, I think backstory should be worked in with the front story. So, you know, somebody is stirring the pot uh, over the stove and remembers um, seeing her grandmother stirring the pot of the same recipe, maybe, or not, but remembering this action and seeing it on another woman quite older than her. And you have that feeling of rising through the gener, you know, that there's a gener, there's a generational place that you move up in that gener, you move up into the next rank when you see yourself doing certain activities. I remember watching my mother dig through her purse, and thinking, oh my God, I'm never gonna do that ever. And then when I was a very young woman, I never carried a purse because I feared that activity, you know, seeing my, and then sooner or later, there I was digging through my purse and thought, you know, now I'm my mother. Now I've moved up into that rank. So those are interesting. Even gestures can give you a moment of backstory. Um, if there is a story related, something will remind, something will remind your character of the story in the present and you go into backstory only enough to make the point and then come back to the present story. Um, if I want to, re if I, something recalls the time that um, uh, a character's mother left her at a gas station and drove off, something happens, triggers the memory, you go in, you remember my mother, you know, I remember when my mother left me at the gas station in, you know, uh, Tuscaloosa and drove off into the night, you know, and I, you know, was sure that I would never see her again. And then the thoughts that I had at the time or something maybe happened in the gas station at the time and then the return of the mother and then the return of the story to the central narrative. So you use... You need the backstory to show um, a different aspect or some aspect of the character's backstory that explains or reveals something about the, the front story, uh, that reveals something about the central narrative. Uh, there's no, you, you know, backstory for backstory's sake is unnecessary. You have to ask yourself, do I need it for this scene to understand what is going on in this scene? Then you'll dip into the backstory. If you have a long backstory scene um, or yeah, like a scene that you're trying to show why she's reacting in the present or he is reacting in the present in a certain way, and you go into the backstory, try to keep coming back up for air um, during the backstory so we remember where we are physically while these thoughts are being had. So if I'm in a coffee shop and I'm remembering, you know, um, say the time I was kidnapped, I'm just making this up. Um, the time I was kidnapped and something is calling that to my attention. I go into the, I remember into the backstory and then the waitress will come and say, you want a, some, a top off on that coffee? Yes. So you have a little bit, you touch, you come back up to the surface into the real time scene. You get your coffee or whatever. And then you go back down or your sandwich or somebody 
passes you and jostles your table, or you hear people laughing at the next table, and it brings you up into consciousness, and then you can go down. So when you have a bigger, bigger hunk of backstory to do in the middle of a scene, come back to the scene periodically, because the reader wants to know where they are. Where are we? We are in the coffee shop still having these thoughts. So you're always embodied. Um, what else can I tell you about backstory? So needs to know, you know, don't, you know, it, it, wait until only if you need the character, the reader needs to know the backstory. So be light on the backstory. Um, so GB Walter wants to know, hi, Janet, do you have any examples of writers who have got this backstory technique down to the nth degree? Um, most good writers um, have this down. I, I, you know, if you want examples, just, I mean, I've got to, I hate to say, look at my books, but read my books and you'll just see how how it's done. I, I, I work, you know, I like many writers work very hard on um, that quality of keeping a, a live scene live uh, while doing backstory. Uh, any of my books, uh, you'll see that. You dip back and then you keep the front story in mind. You come up, swim up, you are where you are, and then you'll drift out again. It doesn't happen in a an action scene. It's usually kind of a, a contemplative scene where the character can take a break and have a little time to wander. Um, Lewis says, can backstory flashes be used to show slash develop plot, or is it usually better used to flesh out a character? Well, I think you use it for both. I don't, because I don't think that character and plot are separate. You know, I think that um, character, what the character's problem is, is usually out of who they are and why they are who they are. So the backstory will fill you in on why they are the way they are. You know, this nervous girl waiting for her uh, date in a bar will remember when her mother abandoned her at the gas station, you know, and then that fills us in as to why she's so nervous. And then he gets there and she dumps on him. Um, and he doesn't understand why there's such a load of, of emotion. Um, but we do. And then that becomes plot, right? Um, so it, it's, you know, the difference between plot and character are, you, I would not go into a backstory, um, into backstory to just tell us something about the character. Uh, if it doesn't have a little bit of plot, in, you know, little plot dust in there, there's a reason why we're going back. Um, so Courtney, hi huh, Courtney, uh, a bit off topic, but how do you begin to map out your plot? Do you focus on character development? Uh, I'm a fan of my books. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're a fan. Um, the uh, focus on character development to plot out, map out your plot. I don't map out my plot. I, um, I'm somebody who gets a character and there's a, they have an urge to do something. They're in a, a situation that winds them up like an alarm clock, you know? Uh, so it's a character and a situation. So I go with a plot. I, I'm a character driven. I do a character driven book and I call roughly when I teach this, I teach it, I call it X, Y, and Z, you know, carrot when character X and character X means not their name, but uh, what are their salient traits? When selfish, uh, thin-skinned, egotistical, um, well-read, broke Marge finds herself in situation Y, 
some kind of a situation that puts pressure on those traits. That's plot. That's what, that's the, you know, if, if a story is cause and effect, that's the cause. The pressure the situation puts on the character's vulnerabilities. And then you can put that pressure on, keep that pressure on, and then see what happens. What do they do to try to, you know, accommodate the situation? What do they do to try to survive? And how does it put pressure on these aspects of themselves? And then which aspects help them? And which aspects have to flip if they're going to succeed. Um, so uh, Peggy says, my mother tapping her tissue on her tongue to moisten it and clean my face is something I swore I would never do. And then I did it one day. Uh, yeah, mother, you, you look at your mother and you, you see those gestures. You think, I would never do that. Well, guess what? I mean, I remember the first time I saw a, a young mother, my cousin, had a baby uh, eating in a high chair, and the baby threw stuff off the high chair onto the floor. And to see my fastidious cousin um, pick up food off the floor and put it back on the tray table, the high chair, I just couldn't believe that. You know, but until you're a mother and you realize how much food they throw on the floor, that they'd never have anything to eat if you didn't <laughs> do that periodically. So, yeah, those are very interesting gestures. And the holidays somehow really highlight those gestures. Very interesting. Um, if anybody does have a, a good answer for GB about authors who do the backstory front story, I didn't I didn't think about that. Um Besides, you know, pick up any of my books, and most good books will um, will manage that backstory, front story. Um, Try Veronica by Mary Gateskill. Uh, she's super skillful. Um, most most people will do this very well. Um, let's see, Ruthie, good to see you. She's late. You're late to the party. I, I'm really late, right? I didn't expect to be an evening, <laughs> but so have you discussed the difference between backstory and flashback? Now, isn't that a good question? Okay. So, um, a flashback will be, I think that it's the backstory is the substance. It's any kind of going back to open some of the cabinet doors in a, in a work uh, will be, you'd call that the contents of those cabinets backstory. And a flashback is more of an, it's a film term, uh, but it means the same, it means you're gonna take a quick look at what's in a cabinet. But always remember, if it's, if it's more than a, a paragraph, to come back, back to the surface and remind us where we are. We're rowing, we're still rowing that boat and we're thinking about rowing here as a child. And then we're thinking about rowing as a child, we're rowing and then um, a seagull lands on the boat and back we are into the present. We deal with that for a little, and then if you wanna go do some more in the back, then you can go back again, but always come back to the present scene if you can. Um, Lewis says, my mother used to like her thumbs, then lick her thumbs, then smooth my eyebrows down. I never did it to my kids, but told them about it. They thought it was funny that it happened to me, but horrified that I would do it to them. Uh, isn't that interesting? I find that it's lovely to repeat those gestures. And if you had a character, say, who was troubled in their relationship with that parent and then did that maybe to the parent, what a beautiful gesture of forgiveness that would be. Or doing it to the child, to their own child. That would be very interesting. and Or it could be upsetting to them to see that they're doing the same thing and, and they hate that parent so much and yet they can remember the tenderness of that gesture. 
That would be a very interesting thing to put in a book. Um, so uh, Courtney is, uh, says that, that my first two books, uh, White Oleander and Paint It Black, influenced, uh, uh, had a lot of influence on them. And this makes me, uh, makes so much sense to hear you say that you don't map out the plot. Um, I have some idea. You know, I have some idea. I knew that Paint It Black would be about this, um, about the aftermath of a suicide and a triangle between the, the girl, the girlfriend, the dead boy, and his mother. That it was going to be like persona in a way. And there was going to be an interesting encounter between the mother and the, and the not daughter-in-law, the, uh, boyfriend, the girlfriend. Um, White Oleander, I had a short story. The first three chapters were a short story. With Marina M., I knew she was going to be a poet. I knew kind of her, where she was at the beginning of the revolution, you know, her family background and so forth. And I knew I was going to follow the revolution um, uh, until the, there was a third revolution that uh, people don't necessarily know very much about. It was the third revolution to try to get rid of the Bolsheviks in 1921. So I was going to take my slice of, that's what I knew. I knew my character was a poet. I knew she was going to uh, live through the revolution in St. Petersburg, Petrograd, um, through the, the third revolution and the failure of that third revolution. Um, so, doing uh, uh, historical, then I, I kind of knew what slice of fabric I was going to be working with. So um, Wendy sa uh, Berg says, Ann Patchett. That's interesting. That's a, you know, I'm sure. Uh, Ruthie Marlinay says, uh, Philip Roth, The Human Stain. There you go. And G.B. Walther says, I appreciate your narration about the reading of hearing the reading of Pound. Years ago, the poet uh, Kenneth Rexroth, who was like, he was like a proto-beat. He was like just pre-beat, uh, came up to Alaska as a guest poet. And her high school uh, English teacher uh, invited two students to meet him, have a critique and a reading. And uh, every time she hears Reth Rexroth, you can hear the cadences. Yeah, I love listening to poets uh, read their own work because you can hear what they want to emphasize, uh, what they, um, you know, you can hear their music. And I definitely think listening to poets read their own stuff and then reading poetry out loud uh, before you write for 10 minutes um, is very helpful to getting more music into your work. So I use a lot of I use a lot of poetry, but I love that idea of having a central narrative and these Tourette-like outbursts, like, you know, like listening to Pound read the cantos is fascinating. Um, you cannot like somebody's politics and still learn a lot from them. Uh, you know, we're in, a, we're in a world now where everybody's so bruised and so tired of people who have, you know, these really damaging opinions about things uh, that we just don't want to hear from. <laughs> you know, you get to the m mood where it's like somebody is a jerk. You don't want to hear their work, but you can learn a lot from all kinds of people. And you're only hurting yourself if you go, well, Pound was a notorious anti-Semite and he was a traitor and he did broadcasts for the Axis uh, in Italy um, during the war. I don't think he, I think he was pretty nutty by then and may may have not under, fully understood uh, the implication of his actions at that point. Um, I, but you can learn a lot from him. So who are you hurting by not reading Pound? You know, um, there's a lot of people that, you know, if you're looking for morally blameless people to read, you know, it's going to cut down the, you know, the bookshelf quite a bit <laughs> because people generally put the best of themselves into their work 
and then in their life they can be just horrible people um but i'm not going to not read them uh, i'm just going to be aware of the personal failings as i read them um just like looking at art by people who are monstrous you know you look at the art i'm not going to stop looking but i'm going to be aware oh this guy was really a bad guy but that is really interesting art <laughs> so it just you just have to have a more nuanced uh view of art and not go into idol mode worship mode you know you always have to have a little bit of you know distance where you you can see the art and you can see the, the person you know and you don't have to you know believe in them or believe that they were wonderful people um that's maturity you know <laughs> um yeah artists and he so courtney's saying are so many artists and humans are morally gray artists especially <laughs> artists especially because the contradiction uh internal contradiction between knowing the good and the beautiful but being very far away from that is a lot of the times the energy that produces art it is a very uncomfortable um, bedfellows between idealism and uh, you know really morally reprehensible uh, thinking and behavior um, yeah Ruthie says inspiration information can be found everywhere even when we don't agree with their views yeah it just takes a little more maturity you know, not to be shocked that people are morally reprehensible. I'm not shocked. You know, I, I didn't think they were. <laughs> um, so um, backstory and narrative. Then if you notice that your backstory is taking over, that the backstory is actually more interesting than the front story, you might consider ditching the front story. And just doing the backstory. I've often thought that when I read these three generations novels, when there's like the grandparents, the parents, and then the kid. And inevitably, the kid generation is the most boring part. The parents were more interesting, the grandparents were even more interesting. So why not cut out that other stuff and just do the grandparents you know roll up your sleeves and do it uh go where the interest is rather than having it be have to be about you you know and your own generation um maybe that's not the story that's not the interesting story um so i remember writing those uh when i started writing um marina uh marina m's story that was a story in the 20s and I ended up ditching the 20s story because the backstory, the revolution, was so much more interesting. Um, so, you know, think about that. Like, where is, where is the story? Where's your juice? Where's the, where's the real interest in, of your material? Uh, part of being a good writer is just being able to recognize where your story is. I, I remember I used to review books for a magazine called Speak. Um, and Speak was one of those very fashionable magazines with the teeny tiny type across the photograph. So nobody ever read it. But I had to read a lot of books uh, because I, I was the reviewer and I had to do new and recommended books. So I had to find books that I would recommend uh, every two months. So I had to read a tremendous amount of books to find eight books that I could recommend. Um, and one of the things I learned when I was reading that many books is one of the things that you see over and over is people who don't know where their story is, don't know what's interesting about their material. You know, they'll have just a ton of really interesting stories within their situation that they could pursue and they pick the most boring one and they write about that um don't how do you avoid doing that you know i guess that's part of the magic of of being a, a writing fiction is just having a nose for where 
the interesting story is. So this is the difference between therapy and fiction. What's interesting? You know, if you could have your character, you know, light a candle or burn the house down, you know, in real life, you, you want your neighbor to light a candle. But in fiction, you want them to burn the house down. So Courtney was thinking about Catcher in the Rye, the way Salinger lets the reader read in between the lines. Yeah, that's that's uh, what we call the unreliable narrator. Uh, and it's a, it's a game. It's a puzzle for the reader, and it's fun for the reader uh, because you're not just telling us what's going on. You're letting the reader infer things that the um, point of view character is not telling you just like we do in real life. You know, when you, a little kid is telling you a story. Oh, I used to do this when I was um, a nursery school parent. And uh, my job was to get the kids to tell me their stories and I would write the stories down and then give them to their parents so they can, uh, the kid can see the tie between um, t the oral telling a story and the written, and the written. So it's a link to, uh, you know, starting to think about writing. But the kids would tell me stories like, you know, Papa, Be you know, Mama Bear did this and then Papa Bear came home and screamed at her and Pop Mama Bear threw his stuff out the front lawn and said, you can just sleep out there tonight. And I was like, and I'm writing it down. <laughs> you know, these are like three, four, five-year-old kids. I'm writing their stories down. I'm like, this is the story that Johnny told me about the three bears. <laughs> so yeah, the unreliable narrator, they don't realize that they are telling you much more than they think, than they really, they don't know, but I can, the reader knows, the reader can see right through it. It's very funny. Um, a lot of a lot of humor in fiction comes from uh, the unreliable narrator is telling you not quite everything, and they they can tell you because they don't know. You know the innocent um, narrator. They can be lying and trying to con you. You know Nabokov. Um, they can be crazy like Dostoevsky or Poe characters. You know they. They think they're telling you the truth. They believe it. But it's like, whoa, that's not right. You know, how could you think me mad? Would a madman have done this? Yes. <laughs> a madman would have done exactly that. <laughs> uh, so any other questions you have about backstory or anything else? Um, Associate. And then how you let the backstory out is very interesting. You know, I, I've used the example many times of one of my very favorite books, of course, that becomes an example always, is uh, Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry. And I just recommend this to everyone. It's such a brilliant book. And he lets backstory out so brilliantly, you know, just a little bit. And then several pages later, a little bit more, several pages later, a little bit more, you know, mentioning Oaxaca, say, this is my favorite. Uh, he mentions Oaxaca, somebody, somebody was in Oaxaca. Um, and then it comes out maybe 10 pages later, Oaxaca was the saddest word. And that's it. And then, so you're, looking, you're waiting for more information about Oaxaca. And so maybe five pages later, it's, it says, you know, Oaxaca meant divorce. And then later on, somebody will have a backstory, has a backstory moment or more than one, you know, have a, has a little bit of a backstory uh, section about that divorce in Oaxaca. Um, it's just it's a beautiful book. 
And so you don't have to play with all your cards on the table all the time. Keep a few in your hand, keep one up your sleeve, you know, one in your pocket, and you can, you know, you can flash it and then that's it and not completely explain everything every time you know this is fiction is about keeping the reader on the this is my fishing pole keeping the reader on the hook you know and then let it play out so let them wonder you know they don't have to have all of the answers all at once here's a question uh gb walter uh do you say walter or walter um this is a re-back story uh, what if one has two characters who are narrating the story um, but contradict each other in, their, in reference to their memories? That's really interesting. It's really interesting, especially if you don't show us what actually happened. If it's just, you know, I mean, he beat me, he did this, he did that, and then the other character, when you do them, says, you know... Um, you know, the she would shiver at the smallest, you know, noise. She was, you know, so it's like, who's right? Who's telling the truth? It's very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, seems like Twain has the unreliable character woven throughout, probably. A lot of first-person narrative narratives are um, unreliable. Because they don't know what is going on with the other people. You know, they just assume that they're right. But if you, you can leave clues, if you want to have the unreliable character, you leave clues that they're, that wasn't quite true. You know, something they said about someone else wasn't quite true. Maybe they let something slip um, and they don't realize it, but you do. Reader does. But backstory is needs to know. Don't tell the reader more than they need to know to understand the scene in question. Um, your front story is the story, and the backstory is used to explain or to broaden or to give perspective on the front story. It's kind of almost metaphor, like a metaphor. Um, yeah, Ruthie says it's interesting how first person is unreliable because they don't know what others are thinking. Yeah, they don't know, and they're so on their own side. They're so, first person narrators are so sure that they are right. Oh, this asshole cut me off in traffic. I mean, it, you know, it's just like listening to anybody tell a story. This guy you know, cut me off in traffic, you know. Uh, oh, he was such a jerk, and he grabbed my parking place, and, you know, not realizing that, you know, perhaps they were going the wrong direction. It wasn't their turn. Uh, somebody simply needed to park quickly. Uh, maybe they had a sick baby, you know, who knows? Uh, and uh, from their own point of view, they're blameless. Nobody is a villain in their own, in their own minds. You know, even the biggest villain that you can imagine very few villains are aware that they are the bad guy. You know, it's like all we need is a good guy with a gun. You know, it's like, oh, he, she, you know, shoots somebody with a skate. Somebody with a skateboard is attacking him, so he has to shoot him too because he just shot somebody. And but he's the good guy with the gun. It's like, uh, yep, yep. Nobody's a bad guy in their own point of view. So that's something to remember. It's a very interesting thing about human uh, human nature. So, um, anything else? Unless the first person blames himself for all of life's problems, which is another blindness. You know, it's all my fault. Everything is my fault. I, you know, I'm a jinx. Um, and the reader knows that that is not probably true. Uh, all right. Well, um, this was wonderful talking, and uh, I do encourage you to enjoy the holly the holiday season and really be aware of how 
how many things stir up memory in this season. And uh, you can also, you know, not having anything to do with writing, but creating memories with using the senses, you know. So, um, something I learned when I was selling a house, my mother's house, is to have a, a pot of, of um, apple cider with a cinnamon stick in it on the stove. Just have that going, that people instinctively feel the hominess and the welcome of that. And it's like, yeah, you could do that during the holidays. Um, you know, little things like that. You know, certain candies, certain things, you know, like those orange things that you smack on the counter and they break apart, the chocolate oranges, you know. I don't know when I had that first. I was definitely an adult, but now it's, it's stuck in my head. On some Wednesday, could you talk about the elements of the short story, Lewis asks. I will. Uh, Lewis, if you could write to me on my website, uh, JanetFitchWrites.com, and ask that question, then I'll have it uh, hard in front of you, in front of me. Oh, eggnog. There's some memories. The taste of eggnog, with or without the booze. Um, yeah, there's only one party that I go to that I went to that had eggnog as you and I'll I'll remember that I always remember that party I'm not close to those people but I they have eggnog and it ties into childhood I just love that so good writing happy uh uh merry christmas and we'll see you next wednesday okie doke with the booze betsy says thank you bye